All right, hello, welcome to Adventures in Lollygagging. We are back and we are starting up a new campaign tonight or today or whatever time of day you're watching this later. Uh, we are starting up a, a new Call of Cthulhu campaign. Uh, we are going to be, um, we're going to be running Eternal Lies, which if you know anything about Eternal Lies, if you've ever heard of it, uh, first of all, don't spoil it for, you know, anyone. Uh, and then secondly, you would know that it's actually a Trail of Cthulhu campaign written by Will Hindmarch, Jeff Tidball, and Jeremy Keller. Uh, however, I, uh, I don't know how to play Trail of Cthulhu, and uh, my brain is out of capacity for a new system. Uh, and so we're going to run and call Cthulhu as there is a conversion guide. So we're going to do that. Uh, but it's an awesome campaign. Uh, I've been pretty obsessed with it for the past month and a month and a half or so, I think, as it was, I was sort of like trying to decide, do I just, do we just rip mass? Do we just do it? Just do, do we just do mass with near the tip? And I'm like, no, let's be different. Let's be different. And so we're going to do eternal, uh, eternal lies. Uh, very, very excited. I'm also very excited to see that people have actually dressed up, which is great. Um, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. Um, and you did too. I did too. I did too. Uh, but I feel, I feel more like I should be going to like a tennis club or something like that, you know, <laughs> or I should be hanging out with Steven's boat friends, you know, <laughs> I got like dockers. We got on a party going on on Monday. I got like khaki You're shorts. And oh man, it's fantastic. Yeah. So on the subject of costumes, I think it looks great, but I, I have to say, I just love long in a bow tie. You know, it's just like, so good. <laughs> you know, the king, is that yeah. the name of your penguin? Yeah, I, I love it. It was uh, Pengu. Was that just Pengu? Was it, it was name? Pepe or Pepe. 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 Okay. That was it. Pepe. Where am Pepe. I getting Pengu from? Uh, Long, can you can you tell the story of the apron that you are wearing on air? Because it's, uh, yes, it's about me. Yes, this apron. I had an old D&D character that's dual wield. So I, every time I went to battle, I would do Rengetsu style. So Jeff thought of the genius idea of finding a spaghetti icon and doing old world style ringetsu. So it's basically, Amazing. for those of you who know spaghetti sauce, ragu, old world, world style, except it's ringetsu. Very happy. It's, uh, secret right. secret oh. Santa. Secret <laughs> Santa. That was like a long time ago. It felt like five years ago. In the <laughs> old days when Long used to yeah. make us meals when we were Yeah, the 1920s, games. so it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Long, we're actually in the 1930s for this campaign. Uh, <laughs> oh, gotta change. Yeah, so you're gonna have to go. Uh, it's a handy so yeah. <laughs> I won't, uh, I don't want to spoil too much. Um, but I will say this, that, uh, it is going to be a, a lengthy campaign. Uh, we are using call of Cthulhu. We're going to be using a handful of pulp Cthulhu rules, uh, but we're not playing full pulp. Uh, but we are doing a few things here and there to, uh, like luck and like, like certain uses for luck and, uh, also kind of increase survivability here and there. Uh, because especially since with trail of Cthulhu campaigns, there's sort of this expectations from what I'm what I understand that, that, that your, your characters are usually a little bit stronger. So it kind of fits, I think a little bit more. Uh, so we're going to be using a blend of, of just like traditional call of Cthulhu and some pulp Cthulhu. Um, and, uh, the over under for us is 10 episodes, I think, to see if we can beat Orient Express. Uh, so if we can last until like February, we beat Orient Express. So it should be good. Should be good. Um, have, have you all? I think everyone here has played Call of Cthulhu, right? We've all played because we, I think this is the crew that we did. Um, is Regency the same? Yeah, we did yeah. Regency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So everyone yeah. here has played it. I was going to go around and say, hey, yeah. let's, let's figure out what it is. But like, yeah, we've all played it. Fantastic. Okay. Um, do you want to just get in? You want to just do this? We're going to introduce characters as we go. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I lied. I don't really want to do that just yet. Well, no, just kidding. Let's do it. Okay. Oh, and, uh, one last thing before we start. Uh, the setting for this is going to be 1936. So I think I'm, I'm going to do, uh, that's what I ended up deciding on. The actual text says 1937, but there's some kind of c conflict with that. But I didn't want to go too much earlier. So we're just going to do 1936. I'm splitting the difference. But honestly, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the other thing I should say to everyone out there that, that there's going to be some places that we go to, some locales that we go to where there's a lot of, um, we take license, obviously. Like everything's not going to be perfectly historically accurate. Uh, and we do sort of present these locales and even the text of, of the of eternal lies itself encourages this to sort of make it your own. And so while we'll try to get like certain themes and flavors that are consistent with that place, uh, at the, at sometimes some of our, our like obviously our renditions of it are not going to be historically accurate and might be informed more by like the various fiction and movies and films and stuff that we might be familiar with. So uh, so just bear that in mind. OK, y'all ready? You ready to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. I'm not. I should have practiced this. I didn't even practice this. All right. So black screen, right? We hear, uh, we hear more than, uh, more than see anything first. We hear the sounds of big band sort of jazz music suddenly kind of wafting into our ears. And when we open up, we are looking sort of semi down upon a very lavish mansion. Um, it, we're in rural Arkham. Uh, we can see that there are festivities at this estate in, in full swing, in full sway. The front lawn itself, which is, uh, which is well manicured, of course, but at the same time, it is just littered in this very haphazard way with all of the most expensive cars you can imagine. Uh, we can also see that there are numerous chauffeurs that are kind of smoking cigars. You can see they're exchanging gossip and booze from little flasks. You can see them playing cards, uh, like on top of the hoods of some of these cards itself. Uh, some of these cars itself, we can kind of see a few of them like listening to the radio as like the Red Sox and the Washington Senators are playing baseball. We we can even see a few of them uh, with some of the uh, the work staff, like the house staff, coming out even in the dirt there and even in the lawn, kind of breaking occasionally out into these these little little blips of dance before returning to their duties. We start shifting inside the house now as the music gets louder and louder because this is where it's coming from. And when we get inside, we can see the, 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 the beautiful mahogany walls. We can see all sorts of uh, uh, paintings hanging from the family portraits, more something artistic, all of it uh, clearly expensive, clearly high quality and the jazz is just bouncing off here and there. We're seeing servants speed in and out of like swinging doors into the kitchen, coming out, carrying trays of hors d'oeuvres and drinks, and they're delivering them to a variety of finely dressed party goers, some that are trying to slink off and hide in the shadows where they're doing more than just dance and talk. We see as we kind of move around, there's women in very long and colorful skirts with silk scarves and faux furs. And we see men, double breasted suits, saddle shoes, all sorts of bright ties, most of which have been slightly undone as the party seems to have been going on for quite some time. We shift more and further inward. The music keeps getting louder and louder, the crowd getting bigger and bigger, and we see a ballroom. Uh, it's split kind of in two. Uh, we have towards the back, there is somewhat of a lounge where we can see there's circular tables with these beautiful extravagant uh tablecloths covered over top of them we can see tiny little lanterns uh flickering lights here and there you can see people are drinking and laughing and they're gossiping around these tables here and there uh more than one or two people their heads are already down flat on the table itself drunk for the night and they're done towards the front towards the front of this ballroom we see a dance floor where the youthful vigor is on full display as there's plenty of people now dancing here and there. Some, some of them are just doing almost gymnastic like spins and twirls left and right. And above this, this, this floor, this dance floor, arrayed on a stage, we can see the source of this very music, the band uh, that is now in the process of kind of winding and closing down as the brass instruments, the string instruments, the woodwinds are all kind of beginning to weave and weave and down until finally, finally, it begins to kind of quiet. And we see everyone around kind of start clapping a bit and applause. We see everyone kind of take their breath as they were sort of, you know, swinging around here and there, sweat pouring down from various faces. There's no real concern anymore for dripping makeup. Men are very clearly undoing their, their collars to, to get extra air. And then we hear a new song, this one much slower. And we can start to see that there's people that are beginning to pair off uh, this nice, more sort of solemn dance. It's slower, gives the crowd a breather, and you can see that they're all very welcome for it. And all of them kind of pair off, whether they're with the people that they came to this party with or with somebody else, you, you see them split off. And once the music gets a few measures in, we hear a woman's voice begin to croon over top and into a microphone. Melissa, can you tell us who it is that we see? Go ahead and describe yourself. So on the stage, you see uh, Marie Wynn, um, who her stage name is Sissy May. Um, and so she is pale skinned, 
She's got uh, dark auburn hair in, of course, the uh, pin curls of the era. Um, she is smartly dressed uh, for the occasion. Uh, she's not necessarily dressed in a sultry kind of way, but she looks kind of befitting the setting. Um, she has, you can tell she's very much values the musicians that are around her and make sure that she is actively engaging with them in addition to engaging with anyone that she does make eye contact with in the audience. More than once, like your bass player looks over at you, gives you a wink. Trumpet player takes the takes the the mouthpiece down from his lips and just waits and waits, counting baits in his head, waiting to come back in. And the song continues. And it was a well-timed break. As you can see, people have spread out a bit and gone and recovered drinks. We can see that there are a variety of these servants that are coming back in uh, with these trays, replacing those that uh, that people have finished with and, 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 and putting into their hands various sifters and glasses and things and such. And after, after the song concludes, it kind of winds down a bit. Everyone kind of turns and very respectfully like looks up towards me and they kind of clap and cheer and everyone's quite happy. But it's then that you hear like this big kick of the of the drum as the big band jazz comes back in as they don't want to be quiet any longer. They don't want to be soft anymore. And everyone kind of picks up and picks up again. Marie, you kind of step off to the side a little bit and you can see a waitress wanders up to you and she's just kind of motioning at you. Uh, she's got this bright green feather that's protruding from the back of her hair bun. And she's got this tray with a a single drink. What is Marie's drink of choice, Melissa? Oh, oh dear. I did not at all come prepared <laughs> with an answer for this. Old fashioned whiskey highball, stuff like that would probably be fun. I'll go whiskey, highball. whiskey highballs. Okay. So you have this tall, slender glass. She hands it over to you. Somehow she knew it was your drink. And in addition to the, the actual glass and the tray, there is a folded piece of paper. And she kind of looks at you and she nods to the back of the room to this dark recessed corner where no one else is. There's only there's no really no one back there. There's sort of like this uh, this barrier where there's groups of people chatting and laughing and drinking. And then there's this small, dark corner where there's really nobody, although there is a table uh, and your your waitress nods in that direction. And there, as you look over, you can see sitting alone the birthday woman herself, the very reason that this affair is happening. And you can barely see her face through like the shadows that are cast over top of it. But you can see this very severe red evening gown in the sudden glow of a cigarette. And then you see a glove hand raising this identical glass to the one that she's delivered to you. And then... And, uh and then the, Marie the waitress will kind of look over to the waitress. Thank you, darling. Like, um, the madam, um, would like a word. Yes, yes, but but of course. That's th thank you, thank you much. And so we see as Marie slowly, carefully gets down from the stage, weaves around the outside of the dance floor, avoiding the wild kicks of uh, of the younger folk who still somehow have energy at this late hour. And you come up to the table and you can see that a chair just slowly gets pushed out and you imagine she might be just using her foot underneath the table. Um, and when she looks up at you, she's just, she kind of motions to the seat at this point. Uh, well, birthday greetings to you is the day everything that you hoped. Well, thank you very much there, Miss Wynne. You have a lovely singing voice, I must say. But it's not why I called you over. Please, take a seat. Oh, oh yes, of course. I, I do hope that my performance was to your satisfaction, as always. Satisfaction, delight, is a really matter. And she leans forward. She takes a little... Another drag. She has one of those long cigarette holders. Mm -hmm. Extreme that mm -hmm. She's kind of like got the reverse grip. And she kind of looks and she leans into you almost as if the two of you are, she's trying to get you to kind of come in and get very close to her. And she says to you, 
I'm told you are a woman who can keep a secret. I have need well, of such indeed. a woman. And then we kind of just start to slowly fade out of that as the jazz just fades and fades. But it's not that we lose music entirely, as eventually we do start hearing music come back up as the black screen kind of goes down. We come back up, but this time, well, this time the music we're hearing is something far different. It's much more um, folksy, revivalist even. We hear almost like hymns and choirs and kind of people singing along. And Stephen, if you could uh, expand on that as, uh, as we look around what I believe is the interior of a, of a tent revival. Yes, so there's the soft glow of light uh, that fills this tent, and you, you can smell the sawdust that's been spread out on the ground. Uh, you can hear a very passionate speaker uh, talking to this crowd, and we see the, the from the back, a messenger arrives late to this sermon uh, and tries to discreetly move through this crowd uh, Wait, making their way towards the front. The pastor is on a small stage and he looks to be like in his mid 50s or so. Uh, he's got patches and stitches in his shirt and his slacks that suggest these long years of hard use. Uh, he has very deep lines that uh, etch across his tanned face. And when he tips his uh, battered fedora back to wipe the sweat off the brow, you see this white line of skin that's never been touched by the sun. Uh, the pastor's voice carries this deep voice telling a message of fire and brimstone for the devils watched those sinners and they are ever by them at their right hand and they stand waiting like greedy hungry lions that see their prey and they expect to have it but are for the present kept back and if god should withdraw his hand by which they are restrained they would in one moment fly upon those poor souls and that old serpent is gaping for them and hell opens its mouth wide to receive them if god should permit it they would be hastily swallowed up and lost. We see the messenger making his way through this crowd as the sermon still continues, uh, and he finds the person he's looking for, a woman sitting in the front row, about the same age as the pastor. Uh, she's got brown skin and jet black hair. Uh, she smiles at the man. There's a look of recognition. Uh, he then kneels beside her and whispers something in her ear and then takes a step back. The woman just nods at him, continues listening intently to the sermon, uh, 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 minutes pass uh, as this pastor keeps going. A uh, bit long-winded, but passionate and energetic the entire way through. And then after the sermon ends, the pastor uh, is surrounded by this congregation that comes rushing up to him to socialize with him, greet him, talk to him. Uh, and the woman makes her way through and uh, finds the pastor, embraces him in a hug, and discreetly relays this message that was given to her. Pastor Wood gives her a thoughtful look for a moment. He then nods and then quickly turns back to his congregation, introducing this woman uh, as his wife, Carmela. And we fade from there. And as the, as the sort of the, the sort of the dusty, like evangelical sense that kind of pervades that scene begins to, well, begins to fade. We open up this time with the sounds of, well, uh, a belch here, a clink glass there. We we hear and see uh, what appears to be the interior of a very, well, blue collar like bar, we might say, interior. Uh, it's fairly crowded, but not overly so. There's a thin haze of smoke that's filling the air. It's uh, it's a it's a very modest place, a uh, neighborhood bar, the kind where folks might might recognize your face if not your name and as we sort of weave around we see different groups set up at tables or or high tops and we sort of start to focus in as some of those those people just happen to fade away as the camera closes and closes eventually on the bar itself where we see um a young-ish couple sitting um long why don't you describe who we see See a slender man, pressed clothes, suspenders, bow tie. He's got a nice pencil mustache, brown slick back hair. He's sitting at the bar. 
two martinis. So the uh, the bartender kind of comes over towards you, kind of looks at you, and kind of takes your order and thinks about that for a second, and uh, goes back and starts and starts uh, and starts making it. Uh, what about the woman who's with you? Did you did you give us a, oh, yes. a glimpse of her? This is my girlfriend. She's French Canadian. She's in her nice glad rags, rags, and she's dressed for the occasion. And so when the bartender comes back, um, the bartender kind of slides over the uh, slides over your your drinks. It's like, ah, are you Patrick? That's me. Uh, and so slides the drinks over. Uh, the lady left this for you. And uh, and slides a note over across, which I've shared with you on Foundry. And then just sort of gestures uh, down to the other end of the bar. She was sitting over. Oh, no, where'd she go? I don't see her. And like you can see where he's looking is just this empty bar stool. He's kind of looking around, looking, oh, God, where is she? She was over. No, that's not right. That's not right. Oh, oh there she is. And, and, and you turn and you can see where he's pointing. And he's pointing basically towards the now closing door. Uh, of the establishment through which you can't really see who it was, but you can hear somehow over the sounds of not music, but just conversation. The sounds of like clicking heels on the pavement as they start to fade until the light disappears as the, as the door closes, the bartender kind of looks back. He shrugs. He looks at you. He's like, ah, Fossil well, give it here. this joint. What's that? Give it here. What's it say? Well, there, there it is. It's right there. Gee, you can go, go ahead and read it. Uh, I actually don't see it. You don't see it? Okay, let me yeah, see if I can. Is. All right, I'll try to do that again. Let's see. All right. Should be there now there, Patrice. Long, are you in the right <laughs> game? I don't think <laughs> yeah, I'm in the right yeah, game. Yeah. <laughs> you don't bother right. that note. Hand it over. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, that's that that's just a cocktail napkin. I don't know what I was thinking. This is the one right here. This 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 is it right here. Oh, here we go. You can't ignore me forever, Patrick. Stop being childish. Daddy loved you. The least you can do is honor him. I can't read this. Can you read this, Anna? <laughs> she looks over. It's like. I think you've had one too many, dear. I think you've had one too many, uh, perhaps three, maybe four too many. Oh, dear. It says, his hangar, 9 p.m. tomorrow. Leave your floozy at home. <gasps> Who's she calling floozy? Unbelievable. And so we will go ahead and start a fade out of that scene now. Uh, and I don't know if you noticed this long, but in that handout, yeah. there actually is a text section. Oh, I just, I just pulled out far text. enough. I was just reading the fancy writing. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it made it even better that you had her read it. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just a cocktail napkin. What was I thinking? Oh, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is just a grocery shopping list. Um, <laughs> so we come back up. And when we come back up, this time we are on... We kind of see this this essentially an establishing shot we can call it of um, of a college, of a university. We actually see uh, autumn uh, on full display here uh, as the trees are starting to lose some of their vegetation, fading green, oranges, yellow leaves, brown as well. We see a um, Kind of a brick inlaid sign with some carving that says Miskatonic University. And we start sort of weaving about here. And we can see as we're just sort of navigating around the entirety of this university, this student sitting here and there on a very well manicured quad, reading these brown back tomes or shuffling about between some of these buildings, hustling to and from classes. We continue to sort of weave until we isolate one of these buildings and we go inside and we can see that inside there is, you know, hustle and bustle as classes change. Some of the lecture halls uh, begin to empty. Students start to, you know, mill around outside re ready to go in. We go up a few floors and we start seeing no longer classrooms, but faculty and administrative offices. 
And eventually we focus in on a wooden raised panel door and a placard that reads, Dr. Beverly Key, Professor of Anth Anthropology. And the door is slightly ajar, and we can actually hear voices, uh, two of them, coming from inside. And as we kind of push in, Ashley, why don't you go ahead and describe what is it we see in your office? Who is it that you're with? What is, what's going down in here? So Beverly's office is very well put together, um, but almost to the point of it, it's kind of staged, at least her desk half, like for where she has students come in. It's very organized, clean. Uh, and sitting across from her at her desk is Annette Bowers. And Annette is her fellow colleague. And she's a short blonde woman. And she it, she's brought a couple books to Beverly. And Beverly, she's a well-dressed woman. Uh, she likes to look good. She has long, uh, dark hair. She usually dolls up with makeup and she's usually wearing some sort of vibrant fabric with the very in fashion, sharp padded shoulders, uh, crisp lines, etc. And uh, Beverly has some notes that she's translated uh, because Annette came to her to research some Latin um, translations that she she wasn't proficient in and Beverly was sad to basically inform her it was nothing interesting nothing that she was looking for so we hear a, a kind of a light rap on the door and we see stepping in to the office very respectfully we see uh, a young uh, administrative assistant uh, we can see that she has what looks to be like a, a small card like folded in half like an envelope basically uh, and she says uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Key, uh, this was just delivered to the front desk. Um, man said it was a, a matter of a matter of urgency. Um, had a strange way about him. Looks like he had gone to one too many fights over his life, I think. But but anyhow, I don't mean oh. to pry. But urgency is urgency. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and she takes the note. And so you, we're going to fade out of there. Um, and we're going to cut a little bit later to back outside, also Miskatonic University. And we can see as we are now once more on the grounds, the sun is a little bit a little bit lower in the skies. A lot of these shifting clouds creating this sort of moody overcast. And we watch as Beverly is sort of walking fairly briskly uh, across the campus at this point. See a few students sort of stop and wave and they try to just milk various information from you about an upcoming exam because they don't realize that you have your own personal time and that is very inappropriate. And we continue to follow as you move about the campus and eventually you start to go up these white gray stone steps of the Miskatonic Library, the university library. You go through the front doors, uh, you go uh, to the circulation desk where you can see um, the sort of head librarian of the, uh, uh, of, of the, well, at least during most of the time, uh, a, a miss, uh, a Mrs. Mabel Sullivan. And you kind of, we, we don't hear, her, but there's sort of an exchange at that point as if you're trying to ask something. And then Miss Sullivan kind of, Miss Sullivan kind of points vaguely off somewhere else. And we see Beverly kind of wandering a bit and kind of looking and looking and looking until finally there's a look of recognition in Beverly's face as it seems that she's found what or who she's looking for. And Maitre, why don't you tell us who it is that, that Beverly has now seen? What do you look like? What are you doing? That kind of thing. So uh, Shima Oberon uh, has uh, short black hair uh, that she wears, loose, they're kind of naturally curled. She has uh, these sparkling brown eyes and, and deep brown skin. Uh, she's biracial uh, Indian American. And uh, she's a fourth year here. And she's got this arm full of books. And she's like kind of absent, like putting them away in, in this alphabetical, you know, with the new desk full of stuff. <laughs> and uh, she's talking to some 
some guy uh, and she has a big smile. It's like, yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Like, I, it's it's really pretty great. Like, I, I'm here at a box scholarship, but I'm basically in life studies. Yeah, things are going pretty good, I think. And she's just got this big smile and she's just like really high energy. And uh, when she sees Dr. Key, she's like, oh, uh, okay. Uh, and and puts the books down and kind of like talk to you later. And then kind of like the guy's like the guy's like ah, ah. and then he just like, <laughs> just wander off as he's just like ah. This is he sees his his chances suddenly just disappearing from sight. Uh, as Sharma is walking up to Doctor Key, this is probably the first time anyone kind of notices that she's kind of physically hulking. She has this very quiet, she she has almost this, like, shy little girl energy about her, but she's, like, weirdly imposing. <laughs> like, she just never really stopped growing, <laughs> much to her mother's chagrin. <laughs> And so, as we as we see, uh, how was it pronouncing? Is it is it Shima or Shima? Hey, Shima, Shima, Shima. As we see Shima and Doctor Key converge, um, I'll say that Doctor Key probably still have the the note in your hand. Shima, uh, what what have I told you about hunching over? Uh, shoulders up, back straight. And and See, she does you, because she does she was stooping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, Doctor Key. Sorry. Oh, we have to keep her voice down. Mrs. Sullivan was so mad at me before. <laughs> and it's at that point you hear, as you're saying, as your voice is rising, was so mad at me before. You're shh, <laughs> coming over from the uh, from the circulation desk. <laughs> Yeah, so, perhaps we'll go outside for this conversation. Okay. And so we see the two of you uh, leave. Uh, you probably set down some of the books maybe that you... Actually, no, you already set them down. And whatever else you had, you, you might put on the circulation desk on your way out. And we watch this time as it's... Like you, you go outside. We see the two of you, like, like camera-wise, we're looking like through a glass window as the two of you are just talking. and just thinking, We can't hear exactly what's saying. But that letter once more is is sort of shared. Chime, you read it a little bit, and it's essentially an invitation. It's an invitation from a, a familiar name, someone that you, the two of you, would have um, encountered before. Uh, various uh, women's clubs within the Arkham area, uh, who is um, very interested in soliciting your help, and has generously offered to make a significant contribution uh, to the Department of Anthropology, which is in its nascent years and could use all of the funding it can get here at Miskatonic. Uh, and very much so with like your skeptical and, um, and astute minds, someone that she can trust uh, on, on a very in, sort of curious mystery. And it's signed uh, JWR, an acronym that you would be familiar with. We will fade out of there. And when we pick back up, we are now um, outside the city. Uh, time, some time has passed. We don't necessarily know how much. It's not necessarily too important. And we fade up once more. Uh, we are in kind of this darkened state, it's nighttime. It could be hours, it could be days. You don't know. Uh, but I can tell you that we are south of Arkham. We are halfway to Kingsport. Uh, we are along the Miskatonic River. Rain is coming down here and there, and we are watching from a distance as a few headlights are weaving down this riverside road. Uh, there are miles, minutes apart. They're not one after the other. Um, they're all heading eventually to the same place. We can see the wind and the rain is kind of whipping around, causing some, some trouble on the roads. Some of the river has kind of flooded over certain parts as well. And so sometimes the the, road, the the cars themselves will slow and then kind of speed up, slow and speed up. Uh, it's a very steady and unyielding rain. It's not a torrential downpour, uh, but it is certainly more than a drizzle. And we watch as 
one by one, each of these, these vehicles, very nice vehicles, uh, begin to turn off this riverside road down another auxiliary path, uh, and then through a gate, which is in fact manned by a, uh, there's sort of like a gated security in which there's a brief moment where the driver of each vehicle and the security guard have an exchange. And then we see a little arm open up and that's blocking the, the gate into this. And we watch the cars kind of drive in one by one. There's puddles everywhere on this uh, extensive asphalt as far as the eye can see. And with a slight crackle, very slight crackle of lightning, we can see on the horizon dotted about our various curved buildings, airport hangars uh, here and there. And there's they're significantly distant apart. And we watch as these vehicles come up to one specific hangar. It lacks any adornment. Uh, you don't see any kind of connection to a specific airline or an industry of some kind. It is all, it lacks any, any titling, it lacks any labeling, logos, or anything like that. The only light, aside from an occasional flicker uh, of, of, of lightning, is coming from the hangar doors themselves, which are wide open, gaping open, and flooding this sort of orange-yellow light onto that black asphalt. And we also see it coming out of these two small lofted windows sitting above that large hangar door. Uh, the roof kind of comes up to sort of a, a curved a curved top, uh, and we kind of hear faintly the sound of like a, a record playing somewhere, and then a scratch, and it stops. One by one, uh, the cars kind of pull up and... A chauffeur or driver gets out, comes around, opens up the back, and we see each of you in turn, Pastor Wood, Marie Wynn, Shime, Beverly, Patrick. One by one, each of you are let out. You're in separate vehicles with the exception probably of Beverly and Shima. The rest of you come alone. Uh, if you prefer, you might have even come in your own vehicle. That's fine as well, if you own one. And as you get out, uh, still kind of getting hit a little bit by the rain, uh, you can see inside the hangar, there is a man uh, that is of average height, maybe like a 5'9", a 5'10", five, five, kind of guy, average build. Uh, and he is wearing a casual suit, nothing too fancy, nothing too elegant. But he does have this heavy, durable coat for the weather that you can see as you get a little bit closer, has some flakes of, uh, of rain over top of it. He has a, a very serious look to him. Uh, underscored by a, a very bulbous nose that I would say, uh, Shima, once you get close, you would probably recognize the look of a broken nose that has been healed, broken, and healed again. Uh, and as you know, each of you, in turn, within the span of a few minutes, as you all arrive, probably within five or ten minutes of each other, and he says something very similar to each of you. He's like, um, take a seat if you would. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Winston Rogers will arrive shortly. And he motions over as you come into the hangar itself to a strangely posh and fairly comfortable looking seating area uh, on the far side of the hangar. It's got these overlapping area rugs. You can see there's a variety of these short folding bookshelves full of, of tomes, encyclopedias, various other books. There's tables that have been set up here and there that are covered in maps. It has this Almost like this feel like an like a like an expeditionary camp, you know. Despite being literally outside of Arkham, a stone's throw away from the city, there are in this sitting sitting area. There is like these deep, broken in chairs and these green glass reading lamps that have been set up. And then on the other side of the hangar, uh, you can see a plane, silver. Uh, does anyone here have any points in pilot? Out of curiosity, I don't think so. I don't think so. Just the it one they a, gave me. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so no, no, it is a um, it is a modest sized plane. It is certainly not a luxury airliner of any regard, but it is also uh, it's something more than just like a two seater. Like you can definitely tell it's a passenger airline uh, a aircraft. But uh, and much like the the hangar itself lacks any clear indication of association with a business or association with an air airline. Uh, there is one small like decal i should say it's not actually particularly small but there is a decal uh of like a, a cloud with a spear piercing through it from the bottom and coming up over the top 
uh, as you all sort of make your way inside and uh, and take seats. Would that um, logo seem familiar to for any mm, reason? I would say no, 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 no. There's 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 nothing specifically that would that would that stands out to you. No, um, you might know. I I knew that, about. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to add on to what uh, Steven said. I actually have a decent uh, mechanical repair. Uh, I'm wondering why I can tell anything about, like, any invisible engines or anything sure. like that. Sure. Go right ahead. Roll. Give us a mechanical repair roll. Let's do our first roll. Who would have thought first mechanical roll. repair first would roll. be the first roll? <laughs> no pressure. Fantastic. Yeah, no. A heart. It's success. Seventeen, right off the bat. Maybe you've flown in one of these before. Um, uh, maybe I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have flown. Fl- flying isn't as necessarily as like ubiquitous now, you know, in 1936 as it is now. But some of you might have. You don't necessarily have to be extraordinarily wealthy to do so. Um, but I'll say this: that you, there's still nothing about that decal that that sparks any knowledge. But you might recognize um, vaguely, maybe from your research that maybe some time you spent in the library or whatever it might be that that looks pretty much like a, uh, it's like, a. let me see. It's single. It's a, it's, it's definitely a single engine passenger transport. You can tell, uh, very low winged monoplane. Looks like there's a, a fixed tail wheel undercarriage. It's all metal stress skin construction. You're kind of like looking at it from, uh, like kind of lingering maybe as everybody else takes a seat or you don't even, I shouldn't presume that. Uh, and you can see that the, like there's these different streamlining spats that are kind of covering the landing gear here and there propeller, obviously. Uh, but as you're standing there watching, uh, this man who you all have seen comes up, you, um, you familiar with, uh, aircraft. Oh, no, not as many as I'd like to be. This is really, this is really interesting. Is this something you fly? This is very, very intriguing, if that's what you do. Oh, yeah. yeah. How to break uh, your nose? Uh, which time? Any of the times. Well, the first time, my brother, I think I was about <laughs> 17. Second time after that, I was... Well, I think that one I was probably my fault as I had drinking just a touch too much and said the wrong thing in the wrong bar, if you understand my meaning. And uh Yeah. Yeah. And I think there was a third time, but um uh, that's something I don't really like to talk about. But anyhow, if things go right, I'll take you up in the skylands anytime. Maybe I'll show you a thing or two. It's very, very neat. Yeah. I like to see the inside. Sorry, those are wide and, and so very dream. He'll like you see for a moment he's like hesitating. Um do you want to roll um some sort of social test to see if you can kind of get him to take you inside the plane right I'm, now. I am so good at social. So yes. <laughs> so there's, there's basically four social skills. There's fast talk, which is basically like bullshitting somebody and that might work in the immediate, but like it's the type of thing where like shortly thereafter, someone will f- remember like that son of a bitch was bullshitting it's me. Entirely it, too much of a golden dream mm-hmm. for that day even occurred to her. <laughs> There's persuade, which is sort of like logic, you know, rationality. There's charm, which is just, you know, flattery and whatnot. And then there's intimidation, which is like obvious what that is. And I know that I think that's what she was good at. But I I actually have a really low intimidate because I don't think people are willing to take her seriously. (laughs) Or or that's how I have her in my head. Um, So I think, well, I'm really... I think I'm being very charming, so I'm gonna gonna go with charm. Yeah, give it a rip. Uh, Absolutely, <laughs> give it a rip. And uh, this is very earnest, kind of uh, gushing about all this. Like there's there's no deception uh, in it. Wow, Look at you, you are go. crushing it with a oh, three. So well. This doesn't make any sense. 
<laughs> you thought you were being charming, and yeah. you are so delightful. And he's like, <laughs> is charming, charming you still the audience? It. Is that what this is? <laughs> he kind of looks over towards the rest of the crew. Like, that's here. Kind of sees the elegant clothing of Beverly and the rest of them. He's like, I think he might be more interested in hanging out with, <laughs> with, with Shima right now. It's like, well, all right, but... Uh, I realized I had accidentally gone Southern with him again. I got, I always accidentally slip Southern. All right. Uh, I'll take you inside. But uh, when the boss gets here, we got to hustle out. You see? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm real good at hustling. Hey, what's your name? Ah, oh, uh, you can call me Frank. Frank Kearns. Pleasure to meet you. Frank Kearns. I'm sure I'm a sunrise to meet you. Yeah, I know who you are. How do you know who I am? I don't Who's know who you here? are. Hey, I don't think you paid to know who I am. I'm in a dossier? That's well, you're doctor friends in a, in a dossier, but you know. Oh, okay, yeah. that makes more sense. She's yeah. so smart. Have you spoken to Dr. Key? She's so smart. No, I believe you. I believe you. I'm pretty sure uh, Mrs. Rogers wouldn't put, a, put her on the list if she wasn't, but... Uh, well, 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 hey, we'll show me this plane before your boss comes show, out. Show, oh yeah, of course, of course. Come on in, come on in. And so we'll say the two of them climb inside <laughs> and they start kind of looking around the plane. The rest of you, let's cut back to you guys. What are the four of you doing as you come into this hangar? Did I hear that there was some music coming from in here? There was, but then you heard it kind of like as you're getting out, kind of scratch. Like you might presume maybe he was listening to some stuff before everyone arrived. But yes, there is in fact... Uh, you can see often off near some of these bookshelves sitting on top of one of them is a record player. Uh, excellent. And so she's just going to kind of flip through and she sort of kind of looks at it. And she says like, Oh, all of me. Good taste. Good taste. Okay. Kind of flips through. Do you put anything on? Uh, sure. Okay. Now What's I don't picture? have, rights to certain things <laughs> no no so i will go ahead and just say i, I, I googled a, very, a few names of some things just to have them ready to throw out we'll just say uh song starts playing there we go that's what i have sure sure okay sure sure uh, oh what star about... night parade i love this song <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it's a good one it's a good one it's a good one hey uh no radio inside here though unfortunately maybe one day maybe one day we'll get some radios in here like the Starting to put in the uh, in the old ground vehicles, but not yet up here. Can't even hear anything anyway. Um, what about uh, Pastor Wood or Beverly Key or Patrick Price? Anything the three of you are doing as you first enter into this hangar? Marie, did you say that this was you, like as you were putting it on? Oh no, 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 no. This this is uh, Mildred Bailey. Oh, okay. You said all me. I thought <laughs> I, I misunderstood. Uh, I, I think I would just be following in. As soon as I got inside, I would probably take off my hat and I'd take off my coat. Uh, you all would see that I actually am uh, wearing this gun belt. Uh, I didn't have it on during my sermon, but I am wearing it now. And it's got a revolver on there and it's got a few shells tucked in there. Uh, wearing it very casually, not like I'm trying to intimidate or anything, but it just feels natural to have it. Uh, and I would just kind of start meandering about, walking around, just looking around the hangar, seeing if there's anyone else other than the pilot that Shima's now gushing to. Uh, you very much don't see anybody other than the five of you and uh, the man who just uh, led one of the five of you uh, onto the plane. Uh, do you appreciate uh, Mildred Bailey? And uh, Marie was looking at at Pastor Wood to see if just for a second, if he might have, you know, kind of tapped a foot or kind of did something. Well, I can't say that I know much about music, but she she has a mighty fine voice. She absolutely see good taste, good 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 taste. Uh, uh, I reckon Marie? that's the first time I've ever been told that. Well, well, that's uh, I might might you uh, tell me what your name is? Mine is Marie. N I'm Pastor Wood. Uh, well, uh, and she will <laughs> just sort of like straighten up for a second and, you know, kind of like flatten her skirts and then, you know, kind of go like that. Like she's not actually going to take you that seriously. <laughs> nice to meet you, uh, Pastor Wood. The same to you, Miss Marie. Uh, you wouldn't happen to have 
any knowledge of why we're here, would you? I have a, a, a little bit, but I do not believe it is my place to uh, share why we are here. I think we have all been told just enough. Very well. I would never deem to pry on a lady's secrets. Well, I do very, very excited by the the setup that we have here. This is quite the uh, quite the little occasion that we find ourselves in. Indeed. We, we make quite a little group, don't we? I, I th- don't think I've ever seen such a varied group of people this is good this is this is all very very good i i've very much like to get get outside and see things and see people and uh let's let's go and and she just sort of nonchalantly just sort of takes your elbow and just sort of moves you towards kind of the other folks as if that's just a very normal thing for her to do I would be as polite as I could be about it, but I would kind of like <laughs> stiffen up by the touch. Of course you would. <laughs> it took 54 minutes. I'm a married minutes. man. 54 <laughs> minutes. Okay. Uh, what about Beverly and Patrick? Mm. Is there anything you're doing on first arrival here? Beverly would have been kind of, she would have made a beeline to the books. The sure. moment she saw them, she'd be perusing the titles and then yeah. she, after a while of that, like she hears these other people talking and it's kind of annoying. Not like what they're saying is annoying, but like people talking and she'll look up and she'll look for Shima immediately because Shima's kind of like her social buffer. That's one of the reasons why Miss Key makes sure she brings Shima to things. And she notices Shima's gone and she's just left here with these people. Uh, uh, my name is Dr. Beverly Key. Uh, a pleasure to meet you all. Well, look at what we've got gathered here. We've got a Dr. Beverly Key and a Pastor Wood here, and I i am just Marie. I find to meet you. As she said, as the lady said, I'm Pastor Wood. Uh, and you are, sir? Oh, pardon me. I'm Patrick. Fantastic. Very nice to meet you, Patrick. I mean, Any of you words. I respect that. Uh, if you would excuse me, uh, Miss Oberon, and she'll start, like, wandering off looking for okay. Shima. <laughs> okay. And do I did hear you just, her in the play? So, uh, before we get to that, did when you were looking at the books, did you just do sort of, like, a cursory, just like, like, we're in Barnes & Noble, or were you actually trying to glean oh, anything she's, from that? She's trying to, like, figure out, like, what type of okay. books are here, why exactly. Uh... Beverly, if you would like, you could roll an occult test if you wanted. You could, yeah, that would probably be it. Oh, a cult? Well, yeah, a cult would work. I, is there something else you you preferred to roll? I don't know if library use would apply. Uh, I mean, you can roll that. Obviously, you wouldn't get the same info, uh, but you can certainly roll it if that's your preference. Okay, I'll, I'm going to do library use because yeah, she's yeah, not necessarily it. looking for a cult things that's definitely not on beverly's radar at all okay fair enough okay fantastic fantastic so in case uh, i think everyone here might know this but let's just say this for the streams the way call of cthulhu works d100 obviously underneath a specific uh specific target uh that you would all have in that skill or in some cases an attribute now we're playing obviously with a rule with luck that if at any we've you guys have passed all your checks so far, but if at any point you fail your check, uh, you could potentially spend a number of luck to then sort of make yourself pass or to even increase the degree of success. Because with uh, with Call of Cthulhu, there's like hard and extreme. So regular success is just being under your target number. Hard success is being under half of your target number. So if you had like a 70 that you were targeting, if you rolled under a 35, you're at a hard success. And then uh, an extreme success is rolling better than one fifth of your target number, which would be like 14 or under uh, when it comes to uh, a target number of 70. So the one thing is though, like you gain, you could basically potentially increase your skill at the end of a session if you succeeded on the test during the game. But if you spend luck, you don't get that option. So you have to sort of decide whether or not you want to um, want to throw it away. The other thing with Call of Cthulhu is that we, we haven't really done this much is that you can push as well, uh, similar to other games that we've played, like Year Zero Engine games, but there's sometimes consequences to that. And we'll, we'll, we'll cover that when the time comes. 
Uh, all right, so Ashley, you rolled a library use. You got a 27. What I will say is as you as you flip through it, you notice that there is the vast majority of these texts deal with various things about um, American mysticism, um, folklore, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, there are some probably, um, there are probably texts that you would probably recognize sort of entry level into American folklore, folklore of the 20, you know, of the, of the, the 19th century, stuff like that. Um, nothing within it, I would say, suggest like any kind of rarity. Like there's nothing in here like, oh, wow, what a fine. All of it seems the type of thing that you might encounter if you uh, walk down to some of the folklorists within your department, because what probably folklorists would probably somehow hold hands a bit with anthropologists in your building. Uh, so nothing really kind of makes you makes you feel uneasy. Uh, gotcha, about okay. what you see. Okay. So, uh, Beverly, you um, you go wandering over and you can see that there's Shime inside. Uh, Patrick, was there anything that you were doing when you first arrived? Going over the decor, seeing if it's like kept tidy. If not, I would keep it clean, keep it in order. Yeah. Um, it's cleaning the hangar. Patrick, you have been here before, I would imagine. Um, it looks, it's probably been a while uh, since, uh, the, you probably haven't been here since Walter passed, um, but you might have been here once or twice. Uh, maybe you even were kind of brought here specifically by Walter to attend. You might even been this one specific place. You might even have noticed a spot in the corner where you all wheeled out like a chair to kind of help him uh, kind of get himself cleaned as it was a difficult thing in the latter years to do so. Um, but everything seems to be tidy. Uh, it definitely seems like Janet has has kept things in order, um, and it seems to be very faithfully continuing sort of his charge, his work in some way. You all know Walter. I'm afraid I do not. So I I, I, I would say each of you would have gotten or introduced to. Janet Winston Rogers, either through a note or in the case of Marie, through conversation. If anybody wants to make a role that would represent you between the time in which you were kind of invited and the time that you were here now to suggest that you did a little sort of curious looking into what's up with this, you're welcome to do that. Um, and I'll take whatever what type of strat- role would you? You can do whatever kind of strat you want. If you think it's more of like you started looking through newspapers and things like that, it would be library use. If you think it was more like a gossipy type thing, it would be probably one of the um, one of those social skills. Uh, it's kind of up to you. Uh, before I roll, might it have been possible that Marie might have met him if she had uh, possibly performed for the family in the past? Roll a luck test. So just roll your luck. Sure. And so luck is a... It fluctuates, so don't be afraid to spend it. But there are times when I'll ask you to roll a luck. In this case, uh, Marie, you might have met him. Seventy-five. Yeah, nice. the fifty-eight or seventy-five. You would have met him maybe once, very briefly, um, when you were. It wasn't at the party that we described in the opening. Uh, it sure. was prior to that, probably. Uh, maybe um, it could have. It probably would have been maybe two years ago or so uh, at maybe like Janet's anniversary. Uh, her and her husband had some sort of anniversary event and that may have been the first time you were out there. Uh, you, I would say this, that you would not have had conversations with him, but you would have been able to see him from afar and you would have noticed sure. a very sort of a man who has effectively withdrawn from life in some ways. He stuck to the shadows, really didn't socialize and he seemed like the kind of person that didn't keep himself in good uh, condition, didn't clean himself and such. But for this particular occasion, there definitely was the air of someone tidied him up. Uh, you can kind of tell. Understood. Okay. Okay. Well, Pastor so, Wood is the type of man that uh, travels for a living. So while he does not have deep roots the roots do go wide and he has met quite a few people i suppose persuade would be the correct sure. skill for me asking some contacts that i've met and i am rolling my brand new norse foundry dice for the very first time nice. oh, fantastic 
And that is a failure that I needed. To see, and I rolled 72. Okay. Your mic's doing a weird thing where it keeps dropping out and like, you know, oh, goes, I don't know what's up with it. Um, so I, I would say you don't really get any deep information, but you would easily just have been able to figure out. Yeah. Walter Winston. Um, in far, he was in the pharmaceutical industry. That's probably the gist of it. He doesn't seem to be a, um, he doesn't seem to be the type of man who is very, uh, is very forward, very in society, but you might have heard like he, his family, the Winston family is tied into various pharmaceutical industries, hospitals, things like that. And that's vaguely how he made his money, but you probably wouldn't have gotten anything more specific than that. Okay. So can I do a library use to look at newspapers? Uh, yeah. So this is more of a, like a retroactive, like between the time in which you, uh, you and um, Beverly were invited in time to get here. Yeah. Like, we'll assume you did some like background checking, but yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, I, I'm not part of the conversation, so I, I can add to it, but just uh, sure. It's still the type of thing that you would have done prior to now, and so I'm fine with uh, I'm fine with rolling. Uh, twenty success. Okay. Um, I would say the bits that you would have are. Um, hmm. Trying to see what I can give you. Um, I if there's nothing additional than what's already been shared like that, that's fine. As long as like Doctor Key knows that stuff ahead of time. I would say that you, the one thing that you would get is that he, um, he had re- in his younger years, uh, he was much more well known, uh, and he was much more out in society. And we're talking about like in the immediate years following the war, um, early twenties kind of deal. Uh, but at some point kind of retreated from it and never quite came back out, uh, until the next major sort of social headline was his death. And that and was earlier this was year. Something- oh, okay. Yeah, it was earlier this year. And from all accounts, it was just. Uh, old age, you know, you know, heart giving out, that kind of thing. Like there was, there was no, uh, at least in the the reports that you were able to get, obituary, that kind of thing, announcement of death. Nothing about it seemed suspicious. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll say at this point, you all that are, uh, we'll say Beverly, you kind of fetch Sh- uh, Shima out of the. Uh, out of the airplane, Frank come downs as well. Like the two of you are kind of laughing, Shime. At this point, the two of you have you kind of have a d- decent rapport. He's much older than you. I want to. I, I want to point out he's probably in his forties uh, or so, uh, but he seems very friendly, almost like uncle, like 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 the, the sort of showing you fun things and stuff, like cool, what, cool. which he, which he, the knobs and stuff do. And and at one point, yeah, if we uh we get on up here, things go well. Maybe I'll show you how to fly this thing Ugh. once or twice. That um, would be incredible. And as you all are kind of lingering about, moving here and there, you see headlights outside approaching. And you watch as a limousine, uh, much nicer than the vehicle, even though you had very nice vehicles when you approach, uh, much nicer uh, pulls in. And it pulls directly into the hangar. And it seems to pit itself right between the sitting area and the plane to the point where like Frank and, and Shima and Beverly kind of have to weave around. Um, and this is Patrick familiar car. You see door open up, chauffeur step out. Someone you are probably familiar with as well. Uh, doesn't, you can tell he's not really socializing at the moment, but you see a, a familiar face. He kind of runs, he kind of runs around hustles. He's dressed in sort of proper attire, opens up the back door of the limousine. And you all see first the legs, these sort of long stocking legs and like the drape of a, of a, of a long skirt as well. And then a very beautiful, elegant woman in her late thirties or early forties. And Marie and Patrick, you would know specifically, she's precisely 40 years old and just turned it at the, the, the birthday party that Marie was singing at, um, blonde hair, uh, worn, you know, dirty blonde. It's not super bright, worn very short tight 
over which she is wearing uh, this burgundy wide brim Florentine hat uh, that just perfectly matches her skirt and her attire. She's got this blend of like business and high fashion. It uh, doesn't seem to be veering too far to one or the other. She's she's mildly festooned with some jewelry. It's it's but it's all none of it's very um um none of it's very Garrett. What's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, none of it's too um, obnoxious. Gaudy. I would say mm-hmm. uh, gaudy. Thank you. Uh, she's wearing a heavy fur coat. It is kind of chilly with the with the rain and it being October. Uh, and she's walk, she starts to walk across the hanger itself. And much like with Patrick, you can hear the heels kind of click, click, click as she's walking. And she's, as she's walking, she looks at you all. Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming. Apologize for my tardiness. My dear Mr. Henry, well, he had a bear of a time navigating around an automobile accident a few miles north. I'm surprised a lot of you didn't uh, have to face it as well. <sighs> and she kind of just sighs. She's like, it seems fate or, or God or the universe insist on reminding me of my late husband. And uh, you can see she wanders past you all, uh, past where the where the actual record player was to what apparently is a small bar. And she kind of opens these cabinets, pulls out some... Uh, and she starts to kind of pour a glass for herself. And she turns back to you all. By all means, help yourself. Uh, we do not stand on ceremony here. And starts to come back to the group. And she's expecting at this point, and Frank is kind of maybe even urging Shima and Beverly towards the, the seating area. Uh, and she's sort of expecting everyone to kind of congregate there. And she's one by one starts looking around. She's like, Dr. Key, Miss Oberon, pledge to see you both and outside of the club, no less. And you, Miss Wynn, I still have friends raving about your performance. And Pastor Wood, and as she says pastor, you can see her mouth just sort of like hesitates over the word as it just, she doesn't quite believe it as she says it when she's looking at you. But nonetheless, like she pushes through, she's like, you come highly recommended. I trust your skills have not eroded after this um, little evangelical endeavor of yours. And she doesn't even it's wait a pleasure for to meet answer. you, man. She's immediately on to the next one. She's just sort of moving. And then she's like walking past and she's looking this time at Patrick. Very long, very blank face. And then finally she says, Patrick, and then sits down and is sort of like waiting for the rest of you to do so as well. I'll pour myself a drink. Okay. And you can. I'll take a good um, look at Patrick, but I will sit down. Okay. Uh, does anybody uh, else? Shima sits and is constantly like looking up at Marie, like, but like this <laughs> very like furtive way that she doesn't want to get caught staring. <laughs> but she's definitely like fangirling a little. <laughs> and Marie had gone over to the record player to kind of stop the music because it seems like okay, now we're going to. So she doesn't even notice that she's kind of walking away. She, you know, kind mm. of. Uh, you know, turns the record off and then will pour herself a drink. And so she may be the last one to sit down. Okay. Okay. Uh, and she does, uh, you know, she takes a sip um, and she waits for everybody. Uh, you can see Mr. Kern, uh, Frank, uh, he kind of lingers a few steps away. He's not immediately within this little sitting area with the overlapped rugs, but he is close enough. Uh, he's just sort of watching, kind of waiting. Uh, you can see the chauffeur that had let her out has gone back inside the vehicle and closed the door, but the limousine still remains in the hangar. Uh, and she kind of looks at all of you, and you can tell Patrick that she, after saying your name, is now kind of avoiding looking at you. She's kind of turning your attention here, turning your attention there, nodding, raising a glass at anybody, anyone else who might have gotten a drink. And then finally she looks forward. She's like, well, I suppose it's time to get down to business at hand now, isn't it? Now it should go without, uh, should go without saying, although I will say it nonetheless, that what we discuss here in this hangar, and what you inevitably uncover for me, is to be kept in the strictest of confidence. Is that agreed? Certainly. Yes, ma'am. Oh. I know how to keep a secret. And she looks at you and appraisally, and you can see it even like she's, she hasn't really smiled, but there is this little turn in her cheek. And then she looks like furtively 
over at Marie as well. And then takes another sip. And then she kind of looks back at you and says, Now, what all do you know of my father, Walter Winston? And she like looks and waits and is genuinely I, kind of curious. And Marie will just kind of remind, you know, the times that she's, you know, performed for them, but only from a distance, of course, just by sight. Indeed. I'm afraid I don't know much at all. He appears to be a very enigmatic man. That is well said, Pastor. Well said. Well, he's told me lots. I know lots about him. Oh, I'm sure you do, Patrick. I'm sure you do. I start studying Patrick again. Well, I can tell you that whatever you do know of him, that is only a very small portion. Um, you all familiar with icebergs? You see this, the tiny spot at the very top of the the surface, but the danger, the real story, is underneath. Now, my father, he was a driven man. He uh, made his own fortune in the pharmaceuticals business after the war, and spent a few years traveling the world. And he kind of looks over towards Beverly, studying folklore. Now, this led to an interest in, well, I'm just going to put a word to it, the occult. And she doesn't seem to really quite like saying that word. He was... How did my mother put it? Bent on battling something. But he wouldn't tell us what it was. He kept us in the dark. Now, my mother and I, we watched him get ever more distant. He traveled ever more often. And, until he spent almost all of 1924 away from home. On the trail of... Well, what he called bad people. That was the phrase he used. More than once. Bad people. Never more than that. Fathers and daughters, right? And she kind of like looks towards like Marie and Beverly and Shima. Equal parts, lovely and complicated those relationships are. And then she kind of looks over towards Wood at this point. Like, Pastor Wood, do you have any children? I don't believe well, indeed, dossier I do. I such I... information. I have a... I have a son. We call him Obi. Obadiah Wood. Obadiah. How very biblical. You seem to have taken to your... He was a prophet, you say. Indeed he was. Fascinating. Of what? Why, he prophesied the end of Israel. Your son prophesied the end of Israel. Obadiah prophesied the end of Israel. His namesake. My son's namesake. Well... What a very difficult reputation for that boy to live up to. How old is he? Well, he, he's a young lad. He's only 11 right now. He's growing into be a fine man. Oh, I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is. And his mother? Still in his life? Oh, what was her name again? In, oh, goodness. Carmela. Yes. Carmela, She's yes. She's my right-hand woman. Oh, well, that's wonderful to hear. You share everything with her? Open book? You could say that. Hmm, I could. Hopefully, during our little venture here, I won't have to. As I said up front, we don't share things. Confidentiality. Even with those closest to us. You have nothing to worry about. As I said, I can keep a secret. Well, I have plenty to be worried about, Mr. Wood. Plenty. She kind of looks at the rest of you at this point, kind of sort of still just sort of assessing and assessing. Well... Sorry for that diversion. My father, where was I? Yes, traveling. Traveled all the time, you see. And she kind of like gestures towards the plane. That wasn't his first. He had others. Some that were, well, less advanced. You know, there are not many of these, you know. Somehow he got a hold of it. Money. Money does things. Money makes the world go around, they say. Well... The second thing that my father did more often, almost as often as traveling, is he had meetings. Secret meetings. I'm a businesswoman, I have plenty, but I don't keep them secret. Very clear, very on my calendar. My assistants make sure I know where to go and who to see and who to talk to and what it's about. But you see, my father, secrecy. People he wasn't in business with. And my mother and I, can't believe, 
like the other dabblers in this occult business. And my mother, well, she didn't like them very much, and I can't blame her. I didn't like them much either. It's about this time when, well, my mother started drinking. And then she takes, like, a long sip at that point. You see, something happened. At least this is what my mother and I theorize. Before she died. Something happened in August of 1924. Something that sent him back to us rattled, unraveling, a broken man. After that, he didn't really have any more of those secret meetings. He stopped traveling. And he very much wasn't well. He saw a psychiatrist for a few years. What a fascinating science that is. He burned his books. He hardly ate. And this is the point he kind of looks over. She looks over at Patrick like she like steals a look really quickly. We talk about hardly eating, all that kind of stuff. And he jumped at shadows, insisted he was being watched. To put it this way, he was never the same. Now, we tried to ask, inquire, dutiful daughter, dutiful wife, but he forbade us from asking about his travels and said more than once that, well, nothing mattered anymore. Now, Mr. Wood, there's one thing you should never tell young Opie, is that nothing matters. It's a hurtful thing to have to hear as a child, knowing that, well, your love doesn't matter, your future, your happiness, none of these things matter. Well, that is what my father told me, and I certainly hope that young Opie doesn't get a similar response from you. I want to respond to that. I, I would just kind of lean back and maybe just scratch at the stubble on my chin. Well... Many years went by at that point. The 20s were a blur. We managed to survive. Financial issues, of course. My mother, well, she didn't do too well. Uh, she died in 32. And when she did, he hardly grieved. After that, he became only more paranoid and frustrated. Think about that for a moment. For much of my childhood, I had a very loving household. My father, my mother, they were the epitome of romance. They loved one another. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, this is the type of thing that happens with marriages sometimes, especially when children come into the equation, but I can assure you that it was not my presence, but something that happened in 24. So, that paranoia, that frustration only grew and grew, until finally, he passed away earlier this year. A very pale and distant shadow of his former self. She takes another drink. You can tell, like, like the drinks are kind of, like, kind of pushing her forward and pushing her forward. That, I must say, is when I found the letters. I'm sorry, Patrick, I could have shared these with you, but I did not want to. However, I will share them now. The letters were from a man named Douglas Henslow. He had apparently worked with my father up until August of 24. Now, I think my theory is he must have been one of the people my father met while at the house. Time and again. No secret meetings, though I don't remember the name. Perhaps the face, if I were to see it. But certainly not the name. Now, this Douglas, Mr. Henslow, he wrote a few times, always asking my father, very peculiar, very peculiar indeed, to write down what happened, what he had seen, wanted it in writing. Now, my father, well, he never did. Never answered those letters, but he did keep them. And it looks to me, at least, though I will turn it over to the professionals such as yourselves, that he studied them very carefully. But I don't have any reason to believe or evidence to suggest that he wrote back. Now, this Douglas Henslow, well, he wrote another letter. Came earlier this year, just before my father died. All I have to go on with the postmarks. I'm sent from two addresses in Savannah, Georgia. And she kind of looks over at Marie at this point. My theory is this man must know what happened to my father in 1924. Whatever it is that changed him. And I want to know what my father was mixed up in. I want to know... What it was that broke my father, what it was that broke my family, what it was that sent my mother to drink and then to the grave. And I want to know whether I should be apologizing for my father or defending him. 
whether he left work unfinished. And I want to know whether I am in danger in any particular way. Now, I will gladly lend you all the use of my plane and my pilot, Mr. Kearns, able man, for the duration of your investigation, provided you do not leave the country for now. Time is a factor, but money less so. I've asked for your discretion. I've offered funding. I've offered resources. I've offered access. And she kind of looks over at Patrick and then kind of around at the others when she mentions other things. What say you? Well, I do believe that access would be the most critical of the resources that you are offering us. And you have these letters. You say that you kept them from Patrick, was it? Is there anything else that you might have that would be of import. Oh, yeah, the letters, if you're interested. Mr. Kearns? And she snaps her fingers, and you can see that he wanders to one of the, uh, they, like, kind of, oh, actually, I will say he opens up the limousine, reaches into the back, pulls out this leather valise, and he brings them over, and he hands them to you, Pastor Wood, since you asked about them, and I will share with you all a handout. Um, now, there are quite a bit of them so uh so this is the type of thing that could take it's it's not going to take like an instant thing but uh, i'm going to share the share it with you nonetheless so let's go ahead and do that and so the document i'm sharing is basically just excerpts it's not the not the whole thing uh, not every single letter but there's several um but on first glance pa uh, pastor as you kind of start, start going through it you see that there are two addresses both are in savannah georgia uh, the first half dozen letters are dated starting in 1925, and they are sent from an address at 513 West Henry Street, Savannah. And the other, uh, the others begin in 1933, uh, where specifically three letters were sent from a second address, 23 Old Hope Road. Now, starting in 1934, the remaining three letters on top of that came from the first address again. So the 513 West Henry Street at a rate of one per year. So one in 34, one in 35, and one this year, and she's referring to, in 36. Uh, and that's basically what you'll get just by, by um, you know, basic observation. And as you're perusing him, Pastor, she's like, I don't know if my father ever wrote Mr. Henslow back, but I rather doubt it. He wouldn't speak about what happened in 24, and I doubt he put any of his thoughts into writing to allow scrutiny from others. I'm not even sure why he kept these letters, to be honest especially when he destroyed simply, well, everything else from a stay is meddling with the mystical. But they are yours. Peruse as you wish. You said he destroyed everything else? Indeed. That is... That is a shame. A, a case that is 10 years cold, starting in 1925. It will not be a case that's easy to solve. I, I'm not saying that I'm unwilling to chase down these leads, but I would like to set expectations that there may not be anything to find. Is the price that I promise your congregation suggestive of the notion that I think this is going to be easy? Do you think I just disperse with that sort of money for a whim? I just like to have our expectations out in the open. My expectations are very clear. I want you to find out the truth, whatever it might be. Very well. I suppose I can do that for you. I just while this conversation through this pile of letters yeah, happening, yeah, Marie absolutely. sort of gotten up off the couch because it seems like, you know, she's sort of done what she need to and she just kind of wants to get up and stretch her legs. And she sort of looks over at Pastor Wood and she just says, um, cases that are 10 years old are difficult to solve. Is this the kind of wisdom that is uh, taught these days in seminaries, Pastor? Well, I, I did not go to seminary, although I, I do like to say that I am Oxford educated. I was born in Oxford, Texas. I was a Texas Ranger. You were a Texas Ranger? Well, golly, how interesting. Happy to entertain. She, um, she, she kind of chuckles very, very haughtily. <laughs> well, Miss Wynn, you don't think I brought him here because I wanted to have him give us one of his sermons, do you? No. I <laughs> and Marie just sort of laughs a little bit at that. I, 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 I was 
a bit curious. Um, I've, oh, Savannah, it's, it's, it's been a few months since I've been there, but I'm so delighted to be able to go back and to be able to be of assistance to you and share with all of you everything that I know there. It's such a lovely place. You are a very kind heart, Miss Wynn, from all accounts I've heard. It is a very, it's a city on decline on the opposite side of its usefulness. Industry down, infrastructure crumbling, buildings gone, well, unclaimed, empty. Hmm. I think you and I have a different expectation, perhaps. Perhaps it's the artist in you. Well, yes. I mean, there there are definitely times when, you know, just like people, towns need to have their uh, rebirth, as it were. F- find themselves and find a new purpose. Indeed. Well spoken, Miss Wynne. You've convinced me. Have you perhaps already had a, a dossier drawn up on this Douglas Henslow? I'm afraid to say we have scant information. That is why we are prepared to send you, with Mr. Kearns here, to Savannah. Track down him, perhaps. See what those uh, addresses lend to. Perhaps you might speak with him or someone who knows him. It's very limited information we have at our disposal. Understood. Uh, every time she mentions us leaving for Savannah and taking the play, everything like it, it, Char- Charma's visible anxiety <laughs> seems to be growing, and she's just like fidgeting with her hands and and keeps looking up a dark kid like she wants to say something, but she's not sure if this if. She should be saying it from everybody. So she, it, it, she just look. She looks very nervous, and it's quite clear. To I, and if you do, like Beverly would kind of like lean to you. Are you all right, Miss Oberon? Uh, I mean, if you want me to go, obviously I'll go. And but I have a fever due in in like three weeks, and and. It's oh, like it's I've like sixty already... percent of my grade. <laughs> and... uh, uh, I I may have forgotten to uh, inform you, but I have procured you an extension. Oh, uh, the amount of the cast pajamas. I would love to. Okay, Mister Winston, I am so on board. Especially if we get to take the plane. And the anxiety for a second ago is completely forgotten. <laughs> She looks over Master Wood you. wouldn't say anything, but he would look very amused by this whole interaction, <laughs> yeah. just like enjoying the youthfulness of it. And, and I think that Janet will look at you and she's like, "I'm overjoyed, Miss Sip Oberon, overjoyed." I think her and Beverly she would share like an indulgent <laughs> smile, though. Like, thank you for the extension, Doctor Key. That's gonna be very helpful. I'll raise my glass. Miss Janet. Uh, Some of us know your father more than others. But he treated me like a family. And if something left him uneasy before his passing, I'm willing to to get to the bottom of it. Well, I'm quite happy to hear that, Patrick. Least I can do is tell you what happened. That is the least you can do, yes. The very least. That's what you're good at, isn't it? The least. Uh, others will say elsewise. Mm, like that floozy at the bar. Mm. How long's this one been? Two, three months? You ready to discard that one and find another? Of course not. We're ready to middle aisle it. Oh, are you now? Patrick Price. Engaged. Wed. Husband. Well, things are looking up for you, aren't they? Maybe the, uh, the funds I'll shall forward you will be a, a wedding present, indeed. I expect to see my invitation in the mail. I'll make sure to send one. Hmm. Oh, I'm sure you will. 
A wedding. Well, isn't that just delightful? I'm just so excited to hear of upcoming nuptials. So it's just weddings are such low. And Marie is definitely like, okay, let's uh, lighten the mood here a little bit. And so while she's just Beverly like, then oh. leans forward, uh, so you, what happened exactly that we need to know of? Because she's kind of like the whole upset between each other didn't really read to Beverly. And when he said, I'll tell you what happened, Beverly's like, what what happened? <laughs> so, Dr. Key. Dr. Key, I believe he's making a promise that he's going to tell me what transpired. Oh, I thought it pertained to our, cl- our, our case. Oh, no, I'm pretty sure the only information Mr. Price could provide us now is my father's preferred sense of cologne and the way in which he liked to have his, his whiskers trimmed back ever so uh, ever so nicely and carefree during the summer. Well, you may be surprised at how useful it is to have someone who knows another person so intimately when that person is the central figure in our case. I'm sure Mr. Price will end up being quite vital to this investigation. Pastor Wood, what do you think it is who invited Mr. Price to this, uh, this small little affair. There's no surprise here. The reason he is here is precisely because I know that he cares. Now, he cares about himself more than anything else. But shortly thereafter, down the totem pole, you might find my father. Well, I'm sorry, I meant no slight to you. I, I simply stated the obvious for the benefit of everyone else here that may not be as skilled in investigations. Oh, I see. How very wonderful of you. I'm sure the women here were incapable of making that conclusion to themselves. And Marie's <laughs> just chatting with, with Patrick. Oh, and you you do hair. Oh my goodness, what what a lovely gift that is going to be for your bride that you can do her hair on the <laughs> day. Oh, that's just going to be lovely. What a spectacle it will be. Oh, that's just so charming. Uh, I'm more of a, a man's barber. I don't care what the cut woman's hair. I, well, I, I do suppose you should know the the limits to your uh, to your talents and skills. But um, well, it's but still, and she's just unflappable. Like this, this is still. It's just going to be so lovely. And you know, I, I do um, happen if you are looking for any. Uh, entertainment for your wedding. I have connections all over. I might be able to get you a deal. You never know. Oh, you know people. My wife loves jazz. Why? Well, say no more. Uh, We will, you know what? This will give us something to chat about uh, as we are apparently going to be uh, taking a bit of a flight. We can chat all about what her musical tastes are and I might just surprise you at who I might be able to get. Oh, it will just be a smashing day. Well, I have something to look forward to on this trip. Marie, I must declare that you are a delight. Oh, well, Dr. Key, that's just, I I do have to say, there's the, all of the skills that everyone here is bringing. I will just, uh, I'll definitely do my best to make sure that I am uh, contributing. But if nothing else, at the end of the day, we can always have a lovely song and a drink. And she just kind of nods and then again turns her attention uh, towards our host. You're muted. She's been sort of staring daggers at this point at Marie. The, um, are you quite finished? Oh, oh, I mean, you, you, you know, when, when we've had the, we've been planning events that you're, you know how I get when I have an event to plan it just, yes, but in answer to your question, yes, I am. And so she sort of makes a scene of sort of sitting back down and, you know, kind of crossing her legs and, you know, smoothing her skirts out, looking very attentive. I mean, she just turns back to the rest of you at that, like, just like this quiet frustration, just between, it's the teacher the pause of the <laughs> just waiting for my class to shut up Beat. and stop talking. Beat. Beat. And turn. <laughs> Beverly gets up, flicks the lights a couple times. <laughs> One, two, three, all eyes on me. 
Well, okay. I suppose that there's no reason we shouldn't be off to Savannah right now, and there's nothing keeping us from reading these letters on the plane while we fly. Wow. Now that we agree. We've taken a liberty, and she just kind of claps her hands again, uh, and then she snaps, and you can see that suddenly coming, like right outside are all the cars that you were in. Uh, that you dropped. They were still kind of parked outside. You can see all the various chauffeurs and such that took you here start coming into the hangar carrying various suitcases that look very much like whatever bags that you would normally carry. Yes, we've taken a liberty. We've uh, made sure that uh, we've got all the things that you might need for um, a fall weather in the south. It's still quite warm, humid time to time, but the nights can get kind of cool. Anyhow, um, and you watch as the chauffeurs then are like bringing them over to Frank. He starts kind of loading up on the plane. Now, I expect regular updates. Keep close attention to your accounts. And I will uh, suitably compensate you for any reasonable request. Safe travels. And it's less as any questions, of course, before I leave. Not actually a question, but Pastor Wood's luggage would actually just be like a milk crate with mm -hmm. a tarp inside that all of his clothing and personal items are wrapped and bundled in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd like to think and that they took the like tarp. A suit is just carrying it. <laughs> just, just like, just, yeah. I'd it's like so to think that they took that tarp and they put it in like a nice like kind of carpet bag uh, and then they're just sort of yeah. carrying the crate next to if it. If that's so the case, like, I'd be looking, <laughs> where's all my stuff? <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, do any of you have any lingering questions for or anything else you wanted to do with Janet Winston Rogers? Anything else? Yeah. So I know you said that your father burned things to keep them secret. Uh, were there any other perhaps books that he often referenced uh, that we should be aware of uh, perhaps for hidden notes within them? I can assure you, the estate sale has been completed. The house is boarded up and empty. All of mm. his, all of his belongings have been either burned or, more importantly, they have been sold for those that uh, furniture, this, that, and the other. Anything of import, he burned long ago. If you took any perusal of his meager library, you know here that there's, well, there's nothing here of any of any import or impression. Mm. I'm afraid yes. to say, his more exotic books that uh, we no longer have access. Understood. Okay. That is all. She kind of gets up at this point. Uh, she goes ahead and she just puts the uh, her glass down that she has very much drank and left it there. Um, and then she starts going through the line. Like she sort of comes over to you, Pastor Woods, or shakes your hand. Comes over to Marie and, and, and Shima and Beverly, kind of, you know, shakes your hand and kind of does a nice, very, like a sort of kiss on the cheek, that kind of thing. And she stops by Patrick and she just looks at you and she puts her hand out her to up. shake. Yeah. And she puts her hand. I'll go up to almost kiss her hand, but I'll stop before my lips touch and I'll spit to the hanger ground next to her. That's for Anna. And she'll just, oh, if daddy could see you now. Hmm. You're going to make such a wonderful ex-husband. And she pats you on the cheek. And well, take a hand handkerchief and wipe up my spit because I don't want to leave it dirty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> As she walks back, the chauffeur, perfectly timed, gets out, comes around, opens the limousine door. She set, sits back inside. Door closes. And Janet Winston Rogers drives away. Now, eventually, so do the cars that brought you here. Uh, if any of you drove your own cars, if any of you would actually own them, probably Beverly might be the only person who can afford one, I would think. I'm pretty sure Pastor would and Marie probably wouldn't. Patrick maybe. No, no. Um, uh, but if you'd happen to, Beverly, if you, if you want to say that, we could leave your car in the hangar. But otherwise, these cars leave. And you are left then uh, with Frank Kearns, uh, who has been loading up your luggage. And he is sort of waiting for you all to, to get onto the plane. Uh, and Marie will just sort of get on the plane. Like the okay. bags are being taken care of. And so she's just going to kind of go up and pick a seat. First time on a plane so, for me. Hell, work. 
Okay. Well, it's, you- it's, it's, it's quite just like a vehicle where you just pick a seat, sit down, and uh, just like when you were driven here, someone else takes care of it for you. It is a quite lovely way to travel. I might need that bottle on the way, and I'll grab it. I do, I do rec- recommend uh, pro- probably a good inch. A, 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 <laughs> I would say at least this much before we take off would probably be good for you. Uh, and Frank Kearns will kind of like slap you on the back, Patrick. Oh, don't worry, they're old chum. I've only crashed oh, three, four times. I walked away each time. Well, that's not in fact true. I walked away two of those times. The third time broke my leg. You're still standing here, so I trust you. Take a couple extra sips. I hear the turbulence is going to be terrible on the way down. And it climbs back on. <laughs> so as all of you one by one get inside the plane... It is. Uh, this is. I'm not make sure to yeah. set by Marie. By, by yeah, the way, that's part of what I was going to ask. So, <laughs> it is a. This is specifically a, a North uh, a Northrop Delta. Uh, so I can give you a link to it. I actually think I have a picture in here. I can show you guys what it looks like if you like. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, so it's called. It's a model uh, Northrop Delta, and it's true that there haven't weren't many of these models uh, actually made. And so the fact that this this family got a hold of one uh, is is not un- insignificant. Uh, but again, like there's no real like insignia that's recognizable, but you do have that one symbol. But uh, but he Frank will sort of refer to it. The Skylance is what he continues to call it, and you can kind of tell. Uh, a little bit that that just seems to be his own way of, of sort of uh, personalizing uh, the plane itself. Um, when you get inside, you can see that there uh, there's basically a, a somewhat enclosed cockpit towards the front of the plane, obviously, immediately behind the engine. And then there is a cabin behind the pilot that's got accommodations for eight passengers. Um, the seats themselves are as comfortable as you would expect a seat on a plane in like the 1930s to be. But it's actually pretty good, uh, comparatively speaking, relatively speaking, I should say. Um, and Janet definitely hasn't skimped. There are essentially four seats along the starboard wall, four seats along the port, and there's kind of this narrow aisle in the middle that you can kind of shift between. So it's not like a modern day where you have like two seats immediately next to each other. Uh, so it's four and four. There's also these little portholes you can kind of view the outside as well. Uh, in the back, you can notice that there are a few crates. Uh, there are some plies, some snacks, some booze, flashlights, electric lanterns, some writing utensils, paper, ink, etc. The types of things that you might want to use. And if any of you are planning on doing any kind of reading, you have some light devices here and there. Um, so where does everybody sit? So Shoshima and Marie, you said you were, you, you were going to try to weasel and sit kind of across Sh- from her. Shoshima is going to try and sit as close to Marie as he can. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about the rest of you? Uh, is there anyone that you're looking specifically to sit yeah. next to or anything like that? I would be fumbling through these papers as I'm getting on the plane. Uh, and then I would try to get closer to Beverly. Ma'am, did I hear that you work at the university? My my eyesight's not as sharp as it used to be. Perhaps you'd be able to read some of these letters better than I could. Oh, yeah. Please. I would, I would love to. I, I'd hand her the Pretty sure. much every letter at that point. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and then sit near. I don't need to sit next to her. Uh, I'm okay. not really too concerned about reading them myself at this point. You're not. Don't worry. It's a very small cabin. You're not that far from anybody. Uh, right, if, right. So, okay. Uh, and so if that's the case, then Patrick, you probably have your solo seat. Uh, as we see like Marie and Shime. I just want to know the order you're in. So when the plane goes down, I, I know who has to roll. Yeah. <laughs> So Shima, Marie, then we got Pastor Wood, we got Beverly Key, we got Patrick in the back, and then you all are like kind of taxied up. You can feel like the bumps here and there. Uh, and then the engine kind of revs up. Frank kind of like, like, here we go. And then starts speeding down the runway and you're at night. Now, some of you might actually no, I don't think anyone, any of you would know this actually because none of you had points in pilots. Never mind. So anyhow, he takes off into the dark rainy night oh dear. <laughs> of arkham and it is a it is a bumpy ride um so over the next uh so this is what we'll say this is, this is what i'm kind of curious i wanted to give you all an opportunity here um it is several hours uh that it's going to take to to fly all the way down to uh to savannah from from arkham uh so you have some time here now obviously we can just flash over this if you're sleeping but if you're doing reading if you're investigating anything or if you're talking to one another 
So I'm going to start with Pastor Wood and Beverly because they had started doing some investigation stuff with these letters. And then I'll sort of spiral out to the rest of you to see if you can kind of want to narrate, if you talk to anybody, if you do anything, that kind of stuff. This is sort of sort of little opportunity here. So Pastor Wood, you were looking at them during the conversation. And then Beverly, you're looking at them basically now, right? Like you're, you're looking at them over the course of the plane. Yeah. Um, okay. A couple different things that can be rolled here. Um, Beverly, I know your, I know your, your character sheet really well, so I will just kind of cut to the chase with you. Um, okay. one thing like you can tell, uh, as you're looking at this, maybe pastor didn't see it. His eyes aren't as good as yours. You have one of those electric lanterns or like a, a mm-hmm. fairly nice flashlight as you're kind of reading and you're bumping along here and there. Patrick's getting sick in the back and Beverly you can tell it, it certainly looks like some of the earliest messages in these uh, letters. It looks as though Walter presumably was sort of going over them in like pencil circling some letters, keywords, scratching sequences of numbers into the margins, that kind of thing, drawing lines from, uh, from one word to the, to another, knowing your, some of your, your sort of uh, background in cryptography. If you would like to roll a cryptography, that would probably uh, be a pretty fair one for Beverly. And then yeah, pastor, you, you did look at them for a little while. You did read to them. Um, is there anything in particular that you would have been My trying to glean? Research skills are very straightforward uh, when it comes to reading and things like that. I think library use is my best skill. And I think that kind of yeah. makes sense for me just kind of reading letters. No, you can do uh, you can do library. Use, Maybe psychology. Uh, psychology would be really good. Yeah, go ahead and read psychology. I think that would be a good one. Let's do that. I'm much better at psychology, so I'm all for that. Uh, I need a 70 on this. Okay. So both of you can do this. And we're going to assume that this is taking a, a decent chunk of the of the actual flight here and there um, and that you're presumably maybe conversing and something pops into your head or this or that. Uh, so we'll start with the start with this. Uh, let's start actually let's start with the cryptography. So Beverly, how did you do in your crypto or cryptography role? So I passed, I needed a 41. I rolled a 20, but I would like yeah. to spend the, uh, what is it? Eight luck. I would need to make it a hard success. Uh, you don't need to do that here. I, I there's, there's no extra info I can oh, okay. really give you with that, with that, in that case. So s- save your luck. Um, okay. From what you can tell, um, it's very clear that this is the work of somebody who is doing what you may be or practiced in somewhat with a 41 in your skill. Someone is, is looking for codes. Someone was looking to sort of navigate and f- trying to find some very, very tough cipher. Um, you even start going through some of the incomplete work to try to track it down and try to follow in his footsteps here and there. And it's, it's taking a little while, but I would say one of the things that you, you, you are very confident once, once you're done is that you don't think Walter Winston ever found a hidden message within any of these letters. He was, you can tell he was looking for it, like almost to a heightened sort of paranoid type sense. And you can tell that some of the, the latter letters were becoming a little bit more unraveled. Like whereas some of the earlier ones, there was a rational mind at work. There was definitely like the mathematics of it all, the pattern building of it all, but towards somewhere along the way, it began to kind of shift and it just becomes sort of this sloppy erratic work. Um, but you're confident he never found anything and you're not really gleaning any kind of specific hidden message yourself. Uh, but you do get the sense that Walter Winston thought there would be, and maybe either that's the paranoia that, that Janet described, or it's just, he never found it. Can I Um, tell what type of ciphers he was using or thinking would be hidden in here? Uh, sure. I don't know what to call them. I don't either, um, but but you and I will go like all we'll think peanuts of teacher talking, <laughs> and then those are the ones that you identified. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I would say with your forty-one and then forty-one scale, and then with your success, you would be able to kind of you could follow his methodology pretty clear, and all of it in the beginning seems sound. 
Like it definitely seems sound, but then it just that that sort of rationality just starts to break down like fierce. Got it. Okay. Uh, Pastor Wood, how'd you do with your psychology role? Uh, shout out to Eric from Norse Foundry. I got a 12. I needed a 70. So that's an extreme success. Nice. Uh, okay. So what you can tell, uh, like, I guess the, the general idea that you are sort of deriving from this is like the, many of the messages are, are vague and repetitive, right? You're seeing a lot of the same things here and there. You, you are certainly getting the general sense that while Beverly is looking at what might be hidden between the lines, you are kind of looking at the lines and the words themselves, the messages specifically. And you're definitely starting to get a sense of the man who wrote this, as opposed to Walter, you are getting the sense of, of this, this Douglas Henslow person. And what you're really gleaning is basically the pleas of a, of a increasingly desperate and hopeless man. Like you can see just the language of it all. He is just begging and begging and begging Walter Winston to write him back and to provide his account of what actually happened in August of 1924. And you can even see that Henslow is like at one point writes, not just for him, but to appease his doctors, like appease my doctors who do not believe me that these things happened. Now, other things I would say you would glean um, Pastor Wood is that you notice that Douglas Henslow very frequently in these letters refers several times to deaths, uh, doesn't identify anyone by name, just says, tell me they didn't die for nothing. Like, and that says, it comes up over and over. And I would say looking at so much of the, so much as which being written, you can tell a person who is literally in anguish. He's, he feels, he feels like a responsibility somewhat for the, for whatever deaths he might be referring to. And then also that perhaps if they'd followed me out, if they'd follow me out of there, they would still be alive. Like if they just would have come with me. Um, but it never at any point describes who died, how they died or what they died from. Uh, and then I'll give you two other things since you did so well. Um, you certainly get the sense picks up here and there. It's not immediately obvious, but as you start cycling back through, you start to see that Henslow is very much regarding Walter Winston as the leader of a group. And you're getting the sense that several people within that group died. Uh, you're not sure exactly what they were doing. The other thing is that you can tell that Henslow apparently traveled back to Savannah right after these August events in, in, in 1924 that Janet was referring to. Um, and it's at no point after that had ever seen Walter Winston again. They'd never seen each other. Um, but it never actually says where Henslow re like traveled from. So basically what that means is you know that they were together in August of 1924, but you're not sure where they were. It's never mentioned in the letters, but he did return to Savannah from there. All right. Okay. Got it. Any, any questions on that from either of you two? As you're gleaning through um, this, it said he wrote that he hid it uh, there. Yeah. Do we presume it's where they were previously together, or one of the addresses that he mailed from? So there were. So Ashley's referring to various excerpts um, that they have. So which one are you looking at? Which uh, which date? Oh, let me pull it back up. I'm sorry, I closed it. It's fine. Uh, August 9th, nineteen thirty three. Thank you. Okay, so I've made uh, I've made a book of everything I remember, and I and and hid it hid it away here, uh, but I'll tell you where. But I'll tell you where it is. Just ask. So you know from the information you got from Janet Winston Rogers that that letter twenty three Old Hope Road is in Savannah. So okay, that's, gotcha. So you know it's somewhere in Savannah. So there's no specific details of where it was hidden or or what it was. Just that it's a book that covers stuff and it's it's okay. hidden somewhere at no point do you have any letters from walter to douglas but according to janet there never were any and at no point does douglas ever identify anything more specific than that got it okay okay and honestly the rest of you three if, if any of you want to jump in and look at the you know these letters too there's no reason you can't pop in as well 
I right. would love to, if that's okay. And I'd like to have an occult focus on this. Um, sure. Specifically, uh, the... There was one in particular that like jumped out at me. Mm -hmm. So while you're looking for it, I'm just going to read them yeah. for the people in the stream. So January 11th, 1925. Uh, this one comes from 513 West Henry Street. It says, please write back with your account of what happened. My doctors do not believe me. And then in June 16th, 1926, don't worry. I haven't told them where any of this was and I won't. Jo uh, July 6th, 1927. Tell me they didn't die for nothing. Tell me. They didn't get away with it. So there's two they's in there. And then February 19th, 1929. Perhaps if they'd follow me out of there, they'd still be alive. September 27th, 1930. If you just send word telling your version of, uh, of events, perhaps the doctors would believe you and me. October 13th, 1931. Are you ignoring me? Or is this your way of trying to help me? Your silence echoes. I think you're trying to tell me something. March 13th, 1933. Things are better here. I think maybe I'm free of that day at last. May 25th, 1933. I'm sorry I haven't left you in peace, my old friend. I won't write again. August 9th, 1933. I've made a book of everything I remember and hidden in a way here. But I'll tell you where it is, just ask. February 1st, 1934. It's been so long, I know but I don't think that I'll ever be able to escape what happened. April 14th, 1935. It wasn't real. Perhaps it wasn't real. They tell me it wasn't real. I'm sorry if I frightened you. December 29th, 1936. This was basically, um, I'm sorry, December, December 29th, 1930. Let's, let's make that January. Sorry. Uh, January 29th, 1936. Excuse me. Do you even remember what happened anymore? I wonder if you've even opened my letters. So okay. the one specific I was uh, looking at is August 9th, uh, 1933. I've made a book of everything. I remember and hidden it way here. Uh, but I'll tell you where it is. Just ask. So, um, uh, how I sort of imagine this is that uh, University of Miskatonic's library has like a lot of very weird books, <laughs> and, and that a lot is of strange expeditions that seem yes, to come out of it. And there's weird absolutely. chroniclings. Yeah, sure. And and that's what God Shama is so interested in the occult. And uh, she seeks that shit out and uh, stuff out. Sorry. <laughs> and um, despite Mrs. Sullivan uh, giving a lot of grief for being entirely too loud, entirely too often, uh, she is actually a pretty strong library studies student <laughs> mm -hmm. and has access to some of the more um Let's, let's call them rare uh, occult books in, in the library. Um, so I'd like to know if there's anything that I've come across or anything in these letters that might point us to something that I may have already read in the library. Or maybe tells me where I should go looking next. I can tell you with 100% certainty that you don't and have never heard of the name Douglas Henslow. Okay. It's never shown up in any of okay. the texts that you've seen before. The date, August 1924, absolutely not relevant whatsoever as far as your memory is concerned. Like I'm just, this is just, don't even have to roll for this. Like as far as you know, that no. date and this name are about as just boring and, and not, you know, just normal as yeah. can be. Yeah. Um, so likely that either means this is the work of a couple paranoid guys uh, who maybe have a shared delusion or something like that, or it's not been chronicled yet. Which is what Trevor thinks. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Uh, it's Maria, we did it. <laughs> if you do, you get up and start moving and try to try to talk to Frank. 
You're like, hey, uh, hey, Patrick, you want to wanna take the wheel? I got to take a whiz. I don't think I can drive this thing. Are you sure? Oh, no, it's quite easy. All I got to do is see this right here. It goes this way. And then you all just go. Vroom. And this right here goes this way. <laughs> uh, as Patrick, you kind of get thrown around a little bit. And he uh, he kind of laughs a little bit. Oh, yeah, we'll be then. Uh, uh, hop, skip, and a jump. Don't worry about it. All right, just tell me when we're there. Best, uh, okay. it's best not to, best, it's not a good idea to go uh, walking around in this thing. You never know when a uh, little turbine's, oh, like that right there. You bang your head on the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, right there. That's it right there. That's how I broke my nose the third time. I, that's right. I figured it out right there. You see, you learned something. Ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> you I'll head back to my seat. Like this, <laughs> oh, it's so much, so much. <laughs> and, and, and With Marie. Just like Dr. Marie. <laughs> So you sit next to Marie yeah. now, like you're or, or behind yes. her, probably. Yeah. Okay. Miss Marie, you said you're from Georgia. I have. I no, not not, not originally. Actually, I'm uh, from Chicago, but I have uh, spent quite a lot of time in the lovely South. Yeah. What's it like? I've never been. Well, um, might I ask where where you where you hail from? Are you uh, mostly in Connecticut or yourself? Oh, I see. Well. Uh, the, the weather is quite different, uh, for sure. Um, quite a bit more humidity. Um, and the, the colloquialisms are, are, are a, a bit different as well. Uh, I've gotten quite an ear for them, but I, I won't, I won't share any with you. It will be uh, delightful to watch your face and say uh, the locals, uh, share their wisdom with you. You said you perform there. Uh, well, yes, I, uh, I'm a, a singer by trade. In can, fact, can you hum me one of your songs? Maybe put my mind at ease. Oh, I, that is something that I, I certainly could, could do. Um, I, I, I do believe that a little extra drink might, uh, do the, do the trick a, a little more effectively. Yeah, you're but, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well played. Uh, Marie, roll a singing test. Oh dear. Yeah. That's a thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's oh, that's right. Your thing. craft. <laughs> Like I was looking craft. alphabetically under S, so, and I was like, mm -hmm. I don't see that. Yes, that is my craft. I even e e forgot to take points in it. <laughs> <laughs> she's right. not I a was good like, wait, singer. oh my gosh, <laughs> she's just got a lot of pep. That's what it is. It's oh, really she's not very famous good at for being famous. Yeah, she's not good at singing, but she sure knows how to move around on stage. Eh? <laughs> that is a twenty-four no. under eighty. So okay. yes, that's I, a uh, hard success. Wait, well, so. Uh, Marie, can you describe, you don't have to necessarily, if you, if you know a song that you're singing, great, uh, just name that and sort of describe like, what does it sound like? Or like, what kind of mood does it sort of, uh, evoke, uh, as you're singing Marie? So the, the kind of songs that, uh, Sissy Mae is known for is kind of all of the, the torch songs. So the songs that are very much sort of the love lost, pining yearning as it were like that sort of the style of song that she is like most known for may so I please that's, request dream what? a little dream of me <laughs> I actually do a really like older songs so that one was released in 1931 okay, well, let's just start practicing or singing she <laughs> for the bits Right. <laughs> Supposedly for for those bits so it, it's definitely um, sort of the one that I had in mind was um if I had a boy like you, so like that, oh, love that style of, you know, kind of song where it's definitely, uh, you know, how much life would be better as a couple. And so we, we see the plane kind of everyone kind of jostling around Pastor Wood, Beverly looking over at these letters. We see Marie kind of turning, giving song, Shima kind of shouting back and forth with Frank every now and then we sort of pull back outside of the plane and now we see like the exterior of it and we see it start fading off into the stormy dark night as the song of Marie is what kind of closes us to black. And I'm gonna, I think we're going to stop there and we'll pick up next week in Savannah. And that's where you guys will start your investigation proper. Sound good? Awesome, yeah. Yay. That's so cool. <laughs> All right. Such a good session. Yeah. Love it. That was fun, guys. That was a lot of fun. Oh, my goodness. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> I just want to talk a little bit more on the uh, transatlantic. You're so yeah, good. We're gonna go to, I love it. I love it. It's so much fun. I don't know who I'm good at. I, I just, I love it. It's very fun. I was walking around the last couple of days, like, practicing Janet. Like, I don't know. Amazing. Dog. 
Can you do yeah. your clothes in your transatlantic uh, accent? Can I? Of course I can. Yeah. Pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Monday will be on next stream, of course. We're going to be at some Frag Empire, second edition. Catch a couple of us in that game. Catch there. Marie over there, played by Melissa. She's going to go ahead and play in that game. And all down there, Shima, played by my Trey. She'll be playing in it too, and I'll be running the game. Sci-fi, fantasy, sort of, kind of weird. In the future, it'll be fun. Tuesday, well, our good friend Pastor Wood, played by Steven. Well, he's going to be hopping into that game master chair. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what's going on on, on Tuesday there, there, Pastor Wood? Tuesday, we're playing something called uh, X-Men. And there's something called Mutants. And, you know, they have some sort of, like, superpowers or something right. along those lines. And Oh, uh, yeah. That sounds quite frightening. It, it's quite fantastical, I, I would say. Uh, a lot of punching and uh, strangle holds, I believe, uh, is, is one of the moves that happens there. Oh, well, we got ourselves a professional wrestler. Oh, would be professional wrestler right down below me, right here. One of these days, gonna catch her in the, uh, the Olympics. You're gonna see Shima up there. She's gonna be all oh, doing a little strangle hold here, strangle the hair, leg whip there, sweep the leg, whatever it is. You know how it is. That's how it goes. All right then. And isn't there something else you might want to tell us about what's going on Tuesday? Some really special. Well, I piece believe of information. that we might be doing some uh, giveaways of some sort. Uh, something called a demi plane has a core rule book for uh, Marvel Multiverse. And we will be giving away some codes for that. So you should uh, wander on in and uh, join our giveaway. Maybe you'll maybe you'll win a free core rule book. Fantastic. Can you keep filling, please? Because most of the people that I would normally raid right about now, which is what I'm usually doing right now, is you do your plug, getting that ready to go. Well, they're not up right now, so I don't know who the hell I'm supposed to raid right now. So I got to go searching around in the TTRPG category right now. So you go ahead and continue to fill. Well, on Wednesday, of course, uh, we're taking the night off. And then Thursday, I believe, is our werewolf game uh, oh, where uh, Melissa is in that along with Aaron and Kipser and Evan and Jeremy, of course. And he's a treasure, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, and the werewolf game is a uh, they've had quite some antics going on They're They're getting themselves into some hot water, but I think they just got out as well. Uh, so we'll see what they get themselves into next. Uh, the Friday after that, it won't be the Warhammer game. It'll be the other Friday game, which is equally as good and just as <laughs> and you're in just it. as forefront in my brain. <laughs> Delta Green. That's Delta what it is. Green. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and then we're back to Saturday. We'll be heading on down to Savannah, Georgia. And find out what uh, strange mysteries will yet to be unfold. Uh, all right. I think I got someone. We're going to go ahead and raid Rook and Rasp. <laughs> You happy now, Ashley? Now everyone's yes. sick and tired of it. Now it's become a joke. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. If you're watching this later on on, uh, on VOD or YouTube, we appreciate that. Consider following the channel, Twitch, or go over to Adventures and All Gagging on YouTube. Subscribe over there. We'll see y'all later. Have a great rest of your weekend. Come back and hang out on Monday. Bye-bye.